a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on at God Tell. This must be the week for plumbing problems. Last night at the Nacogdoches Mission, Richard was up at 4 o'clock in the morning while the back end of the building was being flooded. <laughs> that was fun. Last week we had some plumbing problems in Livingston. But fortunately, the guys there took pity on me because I'm so old and decrepit. They crawled under the building and I didn't have to. I just sat there and issued edicts. Move that pipe. Put that Where's the glue? Put it over there. You know. <laughs> a lot of fun. I guess this is just a week for plumbing problems. All right. We are in John 2019. <laughs> Still dealing with Jesus' appearance after the resurrection. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the context here shows us they were locked, the doors were locked, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and he said to them, Howdy boys. You all didn't know he talked like that, did you? Howdy boys. Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. For three and a half years, he's been telling them he was going to go to Jerusalem and die and then raise on the third day. Three and a half years, they would not believe him. Now after he rose from the dead, they finally got glad because they finally saw him. Anybody can get glad after you see something. But you're going to see how that's going to be very important in a moment with what Jesus is about to say. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now in my ministry of 44 years or so now, I've had the privilege of preaching in nine different denominations, which a lot of preachers don't ever get to do. Though. They preach in the one they're ordained, that's it. But I've preached in a lot of different denominations. And I've preached in some denominations where they're always wanting to get people you know, baptized in the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. But one of the things that I, always surprised me was I never saw anybody try to breathe on anybody. But that's what Jesus did. He breathed on them. There's significance to this, why he did this. He is giving them new life. And it's symbolic of the life that Adam was given by God in the Garden of Eden. When God made the man out of the dust of the ground and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And now, after Adam sinned and lost that life, that quality of life, that immortal life, which is God's life according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, now Jesus gives them new life, new beginning, and he breathes on them. I think that's very interesting. The symbolism is very, very Real and very simple. So, God breathed on... Now, you ladies, I know what you're thinking. You know, I know you don't know I know what you're thinking, but I know what you're thinking. My wife knows that I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, them men, they were made out of dirt. But don't get proud, you were made out of a dirty old man. That's right. That's what it's like. You know... We just don't get it sometimes that some of the things that are worded in this Bible are simply to reinforce or to start over as the case may be in this case. See, when Adam sinned, and if you'd have been there, you'd have done the same thing. You'd have been into that golden avocado too. I know you thought it was an apple, but the Bible doesn't say that, so I got as much for the golden avocado as you got for an apple. 
And, uh, and I got more probably because I saw a movie one time. And Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they got that tree over there that God said don't eat, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they got that golden avocado off of it and bit into it. And so ever since I saw that movie, I knew it was a golden avocado. Because Hollywood don't lie, right? <laughs> when Adam sinned, though, you see, Adam was created as a triune being, like God. He was created in the image and likeness of God. God is a triune being, Father of the Word who became Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And you were created originally in Adam to be triune be beings, a body, a soul, and a spirit. Actually, the way the New Testament words that, it's spirit first, soul second, body third. But we put it the other way around because we take care of our bodies mostly. We don't care about anything else. And when Adam sinned, he lost that spiritual nature or the capacity to fellowship with God on a one-to-one -one level like he had been doing. And uh, Jesus said that you had to be born again by the Spirit of God to regain that. And as we regain that, of course, it's the Holy Spirit moving into our life, coming into our life, that gives us that life, that new life, and a new beginning. We get to start over. I started over in November of 1971 from my perspective. People always ask me, Brother June, when did you get saved? Well, you know, the answer they want to hear is November 1971. The truth is before the foundation of the world. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Well, he comes along and he says, Whosoever sins you remit or forgive, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain are retained. Now, first of all, you have to understand the disciples or you or a priest, nobody has the ability to forgive anybody's sins. God only can forgive sins. You can forgive things that are done against you, but it's not the same as God eradicating it. God wipes sin out. You can't do that. In fact, you can't even hardly forget it. Somebody does something you don't like, they get in your face, and they may come up to you and say, will you forgive me? And you may grudgingly say, yes, I forgive you, but you won't forget it, you know. And uh, that's sad because when God forgives, he forgets. He chooses to forget. It's gone. Now, if you want to understand this verse a little more, you need to read Matthew. I hope you write these down because you might want to look at them later. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 Matthew 16, 19, and Matthew 18, 18. But I will explain a little bit about Matthew 10. That's the one that is the model prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is, where? In heaven. In other words, the idea here is to conform earth to heaven, not heaven to earth. Some people, when they read this, they sounds like whatever you do on earth and forgiving sins, that God's got to do it. It's actually the other way around. You need to understand that. It's very important. Well, Thomas, one of the 12, actually at this point 11, because Judas went out and hung himself, his last name was Didymus. Can you imagine having a name like Tommy Didymus? He was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now that's important for what Jesus is about to say. But you know, he wouldn't even believe the testimony of ten guys that he'd been living with for three and a half years and the other women that were there too. They all testified. He would not believe. I had a man one time from a church in, Libya, in Nacogdoches. He came to me and says, Brother Junior, he says, I just want you to know. He says, I wish I could believe the things of God like you do. And I said, why don't you? He says, I can't. I said, no, it's not because you can't. It's because you won't. Anybody can believe. If I can believe it, you can believe it. I was an atheist till I was 24 because my mother brought me up. There's no God. There's no God. And then she ran off when I was nine years old. And I only saw her about two or three times after that. But she didn't believe there was any kind of a God at all. Her whole family was like that. And my aunt, Katie, when uh, years later after I got saved and I told her about Jesus coming in my heart and everything, she looked at me and said, this is what she said, she said, your mother's probably rolling over in her grave now. That was something kind of 
kind of cruel to say to somebody, but you know, that's what she believed. And I don't fault her for having her belief. She doesn't believe there's a God. And she's getting really old. And so she may die pretty soon. And if she does, I hope she doesn't die without Jesus because then she's going to find out there is a God. And he's very serious. Well, Thomas wouldn't believe. So eight days later, again, his disciples were within. Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. And he stood in the midst and he said, Howdy, boys. He likes to repeat himself. Peace be unto you. And he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither your hand, and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. And that's the theme of John's Gospel. I tell you, you find this in every chapter. Jesus is God. He is the creator of everything we see and the creator of things we don't see. John 1.1 1, 1 is where it started. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Verse 14, And that Word that was God became flesh. He is God. He's the only God. The Muslims do not have the right God. They keep saying that Allah is the only God, but they're going to find out that Jesus is God. And they're going to face Him. And the neat thing about our God is He's the only one that rose from the dead. All the rest of them are still in the ground. All the saviors of all the religions. They're in the ground. The Buddhists, He's dead, you know. Krishna, He's dead. God of the Mormons, they got so many gods, I don't know why they're not confused, you know. <laughs> yeah, they really are. It's, just, it's a mess. You need to understand this. Jesus declares himself to be the only God. Either he's right or he's a lunatic or a liar. You can't have it both ways. He's either right or he's wrong. And the interesting thing about it is he gave us a book that tells us how to live and we don't have to strap dynamite on our bodies and blow a shopping mall up to get into paradise, which I am very glad about. I have no desire to do that. I'd really like to just die in my sleep in my bed, you know. That would be cool. Of course, I might. My wife probably slap me when I'm asleep and kill me. Thomas didn't want to believe, but now he's forced to believe. But look what Jesus said. This is the important part. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. You see, he, he was supposed to believe the testimony. We're supposed to believe the testimony. I've never seen Jesus. I wasn't there when he walked on the water. I didn't see him raise Lazarus from the dead. I didn't see him feed 5,000 men plus the women and children with two fish and five loaves of bread. I didn't see him when he talked to Moses at the burning bush. I didn't see him when he burned down Sodom and Gomorrah either. But he did that because of their sin and homosexuality was one of them. God is not happy with that whole bunch. I keep telling people, you know, they were on the news today again. Everything, all, I, I, I'm getting to where I don't even want to listen to the news anymore because they always have something about transgenders or homosexuals or something like that and they make it sound like you know that they're just going to be accepted of God and led into heaven it's not going to happen Romans chapter 1 and also in the book of Deuteronomy God said it was an abomination to him God didn't make Adam and Steve he made Adam and Eve think about that God knows what he's doing we try to pervert and change everything. And we start with the smallest things. Have you noticed how many people say to you when you ask them how they're doing, they say good? You know, that only started a few years ago. We didn't used to say, we say blessed. We say, oh, I'm all right for an old person, you know, stuff. But now everybody just says good. Why? Because God says there's none good. So the devil starts putting that in people's minds. So everybody starts <laughs> saying they're good. When people say, are you doing good? I say, well, I'm doing good, but I'm not good. 
Because I'm not. There's none good. None of you are good. I'm not good. Nancy, she ain't good. Mary's almost good. But she's not good either. None of us are. We have wicked hearts. We all are capable of any sin you can think of. The difference is those that are Christians are being controlled by this new nature that God gives us, the Spirit of God, and the people that are lost don't have that, so they just do whatever. And if you're not going to be a Christian, if you don't want to be a Christian, then I, my suggestion to you is get it all now. Do everything you can because you're not going to have any fun in hell. You might as well have at least a few memories to take with you, you know. Sing that song, grab all the gusto you can get because you only go around once in life. And be sure that as you're going around that merry-go-round, you make a good attempt to get that brass ring. Because you're not going to get it in hell. And if you did grab a brass ring in hell, it would burn you up. It'd be molten brass. <laughs> That's why I always tell everybody, I say, oh, it's hot. I say, no, this is not hot. This is mildly warm. Now, folks, hell is hot. That's hot. You don't want to go there. Trust me, you don't want to go there. Believe me, you don't want to go there. And that's what this was all about. You know, I've, I've watched people over the years, it's pretty amazing, people in some denominations are always looking for another miracle, you know, a healing or something, you know. And what happens is when they see something like that, their faith goes way up like this, where they can almost conquer a mountain, you know. But then after a while, if they don't see another miracle, their faith starts coming down, takes a nosedive. And then they've got to see another miracle. Well, Jesus wanted us to believe because of what he said and who he is so we could just be on even plane. Not all these ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. Thomas, you believe because you see, but blessed or happy are they that don't see anything and yet make a choice to believe. And that's what it's all about. It's about choices. Everything in life is about choices. Even if you don't consciously make a choice, whatever you're doing, you made a choice. Every time you get a plate of food out of there, you make a choice. You're either going to eat it or toss it. Most of you eat it because food is good. I like food. I love coming to Martin and Mary's house on Monday because Mary always feeds us good food. I haven't had nothing bad here yet. Mary always got something really good. Of course, she knows that I don't like black-eyed peas, so she doesn't serve them. <laughs> she always got something good. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So there's a lot of things Jesus did that never got written down. There was too many of them. As the last verse the next chapter will explain, we'll get to that next week. But these are written for a purpose. Why? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's why this book was written down, so you could have eternal life. Over in John chapter 3, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in verse 36, it says, If you have the Son, you have life. But if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. And the wrath of God abides on you. Now, folks, only God can do this. And that's why I don't understand why people cling to these other religions where it's all about works. That's why these people, they're very religious to blow themselves up. Do you know that? you got to be religious to do something like that. Or be up and down the street with your little briefcase, you know, trying to peddle your Watchtower magazines. Or missionary boys from the Mormon church. You ever watch them guys? They're beautiful. They ride bicycles in 110 degree weather and they don't even sweat. You ever notice that? You ought to pay attention. They can lift up their arm any day. I can't. Somebody might smell me. <laughs> it's works. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to go visit these people. I got to give them a magazine. I got to do this. I got to do that. Works will never get you into heaven. The Bible says, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be saved. There's nothing you can do except to trust Jesus and let him do it. He will change you. 
Now, back in November of 1971, I was in jail for the umpteenth time. You know, people don't know this about me because they think I was just perfect from birth, but I wasn't. I was arrested the first time when I was 10 years old for shoplifting. And then it was all the time. So I was in and out of jail all the time. And by the time I was 24 years old, I looked like I was going to be there for the rest of my life. And if God hadn't intervened, I would be. I'd still be there. And I didn't know what to do. I was, for the first time in my life, I was what we call beside ourselves. I was, I was hurt. I was at the bottom. Good place to be. I tried to commit suicide a couple times. Tried to get somebody else to kill me once. Nothing ever worked right. And I'm there and I'm looking for answers finally. Finally, after 24 years of a perverted lifestyle, you know, living on the streets of Los Angeles and just doing what I wanted to do. And all of a sudden here I am in this cage where animals belong, not people. And um, I didn't know what to do. And I, I took a Bible down off a, off a shelf. I've been reading a little bit of this book by David Wilkerson, The Cross and Switchblade. Didn't even know what it meant. People getting saved sounded strange to me. But I took this Bible down and God speaks through his word. I don't know how he does this, but he does it. And I just threw it on the bunk and it opened. Isaiah 14, 3. And the first words that caught my eye were, you will be released from the hard bondage you were made to serve. And I got happy and I said, that's what I need, man, out of here. But God wasn't talking about the cell. He was talking about the bondage that I was in to sin. And I found that out shortly thereafter as I kept reading. So I prayed a very, as I used to say, an unbaptistic prayer, <laughs> unchristian prayer. And I am so glad that God looks at our heart and not just the words that come out of our mouth, because usually we don't know what to say. And I was taught that God didn't exist, so I said, God, if you're there, I want you to change me or kill me. When I tell people what God did, they can't believe it. But you know what God did? He killed me. That's right. God's not in the business of just patching things up. He gave me a new nature, killed the old one. And he's still doing it. Because that old nature keeps trying to creep himself up. I've got him in a box and I sit on it, spiritually speaking. But every once in a while, he, he tries to climb out of there, you know, and take control again. It's a battle. But Christians have a war going on inside that other people don't have. The new nature and the old nature are battling back and forth constantly until the day we drop out of this life. But you don't have to submit to the old nature. Oh, he'll give you wrong thoughts. He'll give you ideas. But because you've got the new nature, you don't have to do them. That's the most beautiful thing in the world. You don't have to. It kind of reminds me of that Star Trek where Kirk said, after one of the aliens says, your race is a murderous race. You're always killing each other. He says, well, we don't have to all the time. He says, we could just get up today and say, well, I'm not going to kill anybody today. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good Christian example. You know, I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to be a drunk. I'm not going to be in bondage to any habits. I'm going to treat my wife like I'm supposed to. My brother, I'm worried about him. He, he just got married. Boy, they're just, they're young married people, you know. Well, they're old married people, but anyway, uh, they're struggling right now. And I, and, and I don't think he knows that a lot of it's his fault because he doesn't know really how to treat a woman yet. It takes a long, it took me a long time. My wife beat me up so many times. No. <laughs> <laughs> That old iron skillet she had, she, I love it. She's too old to lift it. You know, back in the old days, she was young, had those muscles and all. No, we learned from the Word of God how to treat each other. And we're not perfect, but we've been married 42 years. And we're not planning on leaving each other unless somebody offers me a new Corvette, then I might think about it. Jesus put these things in this book, not just this passage, but the whole thing, so you would know that you could choose to believe. 
So don't ever say you can't believe because that's not true. If you don't want to believe, that's your business. But you can believe it because it's the truth. And the truth can set you free. A lie can only put you in bondage. And then you'll be doing weird stuff in the name of your God, you know. Father, we thank you for loving us tonight. We thank you for each one in this room. And we hope they're listening. We hope they're taking notes, searching, hopefully, the scriptures to see if these things are true or not. We thank you that Jesus came and died and paid the penalty for our sin and rose from the dead. We're so grateful that because he rose from the dead and he promised to return, he can return and he will. And boy, there's going to be a lot of sorry people on this earth when Jesus comes back. Because so many in this world, the majority have been spitting in his face ever since he left. And they're going to have to answer for it. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for meeting our needs today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.